welcome back to Faith, Frauds, and Falsehoods. Sorry, Matt, we didn't say it to start with, but uh, we're we're starting our discussion tonight on the International Churches of Christ, uh, Boston Movement, Kip McKean, whatever you want to call it. Um, So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and help others to find us. Now, before we begin, let's make it clear that the opinions we present are ours alone. They do not represent the views or opinions of our respective churches or employers. Yeah. Brian, let's begin. Welcome back, Matt. So before we get started, another before we get started, you're going to have to put that fidget thing down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me switch to my silent fidget spinner. So our uh, our friend Corey posted a thing on Facebook about this thing, about like, don't lose this thing or borrow it mm. to friends or loan right. it to friends don't or something. Don't it to a friend. And uh, I see him a picture of this on my desk. This is my silent fidget spinner uh, fidget okay, thing. Something to play with that doesn't make any noise. Yeah, I was using fidget toys before they were popular. Yep. Before all the cool kids had fidget toys, I always had a broken eraser or a pencil or a chain or a watch or a quarter yep. or a rock I found my whole life. Yep, something to play with. Keeps it going. So, Matt, we're we're talking about the International Churches of Christ, right? This is not the Church of Christ. Right, not the mainstream Church of Christ. It's an offshoot yeah. of the Church of Christ. Yeah, let's be very clear about that. This is not what you. This is probably not the Church of Christ down the street from you. Right. However, down the street from me <laughs> is the International Christian Church, Church of Christ. Yeah, but not the one we're talking about. Wait. Right. It's not? It's not. But but it's the International Christian Church? Right, but it's not the one we're talking about. So are there two International Christian Churches? This one is just an independent congregation that's down the street from me that has nothing to do with Kit McKean or any of these people or any of this stuff at all. Matter of fact, they're a a multi-ethnic church. I mean, this is a church we're going to talk about multi-ethnic too, but um, specializing in like Japanese and American services and stuff. Mm, Okay. Uh, but I Googling, they came up first because geographically they're close to me. Right. And they're not at all the same church. They're just one independent church there. Um, so this is not the Church of Christ we're talking about. We're talking about the ICOC. Right. Later, the ICC, specifically the movement started by Kit McKean. Right. Exactly. Well, maybe started by other people first, but the movement popularized mm-hmm. and majorly yeah, led by he, Kit McKean. He took it and ran with it. So we got to stick this in 30 minutes and we're already three minutes into here. So I got 27 That's minutes right. to tell y'all 30 years worth of stuff. Oh, That's oh, right. Oh, so 50. we're going to, we're going to start in the same spot that we always start here lately in the sixties. Uh, Every time, man, <laughs> because most of these groups that we've talked about so far have come from the sixties. So what you're saying is it's the baby boomers' fault. I mean, I I was thinking more, you know, just the culture of the times was so open and extravagant with things that it led to a bunch of craziness. But you can blame it on the baby boomers. Wait, so now you're blaming the hippies? I'm blaming the hippies. Yep. Damn dirty hippies. Wow. Okay, well, we've had this conversation a few times, y'all, and actually went a little different way with this, and we've discussed the many reasons why a lot of cults, there was a revival happening in America at that time, or a, some people called it a revival. There was definitely spiritual awakening, spiritual things happening. Now I done lost my silent fidget, so I got to use a a pen or something here. There you go. Yep. Um, And try not to click it, because that might get old. All right, Um, so 1967. Yeah, 1967. (laughs) So Kip McKean was a student at the University of Florida. Um, okay. Y'all will find as we talk about this group that most people in this group started college. Not everybody finished college, but a lot of people started college. Um, and we'll get into more reasons on that in the social episode. Mm-hmm. Um, he was started as a student at the University of Florida, and he met a guy named Chuck Lucas. Chuck okay. Lewis, Lucas was involved in the Church of Christ there in Gainesville. This is the, uh, the normal the mainstream, mainstream Church of yep. Christ. Chuck Lewis had started a college ministry and started reaching out to college students there at the University of Florida. And he started with what became called the Crossroad Movement. 
and it eventually became the Crossroads Church of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was characterized with very uh, very aggressive evangelism. Pretty much, you know, all right, you've been saved, go find someone else. And with one on one discipleship, those were characteristics of 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 uh, Chuck Lewis's Crossroads movement. Mm-hmm. And so Kit McKean was a very enthusiastic uh, disciple and very enthusiastic uh, follower of Chuck Lewis and, and his methods there. Brian, we're on video now, so everybody can see that you're questioning what I'm saying. So go ahead no, and no, say no. what you're I'm, thinking. No, I'm, I was looking um, because I was thinking when you were talking about the extreme evangelism, that evangelism explosion also came out of Florida. Uh, but it's a little bit further away from Gainesville. So I didn't know if there was a connection there ah, uh, okay. or not. Well, this was the start of the popularized college ministry things, mm-hmm. right? Because, um, you know, that's a popular thing even on college campuses now is to go do evangelizing on college campuses. Yeah. Yeah. You've got campus crusades and all the right. others. And pretty much every nomination or most nominations have some sort of college ministry type thing where they do something, right? Mm-hmm. Some are more aggressive in the evangelism than others, but um, but their big thing was one-on-one discipleship and really aggressive evangelism, telling others, telling others. In 1979, so so Kip McKean was involved there for a while. In 1979, Kip had he went to college, he did some seminary stuff, and he had um been involved in a couple, several different churches. However, several of these churches thought he was a little too much. A little too okay. aggressive, a yeah. little too much. In 1979, he was called to the Lexington Church of Christ in Massachusetts. And that's where he began, began what eventually became called the Boston Movement. The Boston Movement was also characterized by aggressive evangelism and a focus on intense discipleship, but way more so. Mm-hmm. They did um, what they would call is, and we'll go into the teachings more about this, but they actually would assign you a discipler who is the person over you who would right. tell you what to do. And it was more and more, not just how to read the yep. Bible, but more your daily life. Uh, interesting right. thing about that is that Kip only agreed to become their pastor. If every member in the church voted to become totally committed, there was estimated there's around 30 members at the time. And he said, Hey, I'll come and be your pastor. They were impressed with the work he'd been doing with the crossroads, crossroads mm-hmm. movement. And so they all decided to be totally committed. That meant their whole lives, everything, they would come to every service, not just Sundays, but all the services, everything in their life would be about the church. Totally committed follower of Christ. I mean, the circles I come from, being a totally committed follower of Christ is not necessarily a bad thing, but it went so much further than what really most people mean by that. Yeah, and, and this is obviously something we get much deeper into in the teachings episode, but totally committed in the ICOC world is different than totally committed in the Baptist world or totally committed in the Catholic world or the Orthodox world or anything like that. It's right. It's not just giving up your life, but you're giving up your autonomy. Right. A lot of times your free will, um, which is a gift from God. So why don't we give that up? Right. Uh, But then, so 1979, he did. He mm-hmm. he went there, the Lexington Church of Christ, and in 1982. So when he was there for a few years, the what was now called the Boston Church of Christ disassociated themselves from the Lexington Church of Christ and declared themselves okay. an autonomous congregation. Now, I found various sources of information on this, and I'm not exactly clear if that's what happened that he led the Boston church of Christ out of the Lexington church of Christ. And there are two separate groups, or if he just simply moved the Lexington church of Christ into Boston itself. I found sources saying both things. So it's not completely clear if there still was a Lexington church of Christ left. The one thing we do know is that he wanted to move more into a bigger city. So there was more opportunity to recruit people. And when we talk about their teachings and maybe even the social stuff, we'll talk about the recruitment yeah. methods pretty much require a big city. It's like MLM. Mm-hmm. You can't run an MLM scam in the middle of Hope, Arkansas, because there's not enough people right. there. 
Right. Um, same thing here. The way they recruiting worked, they churned through people so much they need to be in a bigger city. So they moved into Boston and there were officially the Boston Church of Christ. Mm-hmm. In 1983, just a year after that, they planted the London Church of Christ. Now, they actually planted several other churches since then. There were some churches who were traditional Church of Christ churches who heard about the great um, increase, how their numbers were increasing so much in the Boston Church of Christ, that they came to Kit McKean and they said, hey, uh, we we want the growth you're having. How do you do it? And what he did was he would take leaders he had raised up and send them to those churches and then take mm-hmm. their leaders and bring them back to Boston and leave them in Boston. So he right. put all new leadership in those churches and he kind of just took over churches and then grew them that way. But he also really wanted to do this international thing and go international. So the first mm-hmm. international church of Christ was planted in London in 1983. In 1985, that's when they started using the term international churches of Christ to describe themselves. Uh, anybody who was part of the Boston movement. Right. Okay. In 88, so now he's been there, what, almost 10 years, the yeah. Crossroads movement, Chuck Lucas's thing, has started falling apart. There's various things on that, and we'll cover that as another group maybe at some time, what happened with the Crossroads movement and Chuck Lucas. But there was definitely some moral failings that had happened, some different things. That started falling apart, and the Crossroads movement things were very similar And Kip had come out of this. So churches that were involved in the Crossroads movement joined the Boston movement. Mm -hmm. Um, And they kind of became one. In 1990, so now they're they're officially the International Churches of Christ, the ICAOC claimed to have churches in all six populated continents by 1990. So in less than, what, what is that, 20 years? They founded churches in six continents. That's it. That's insane. That's a lot. That's quick. They yeah. had a very fast growth rate, very high churn rate, too. Right. Um, Kent McKean then moved to Los Angeles and started a church there, and that became the new headquarters of the ICOC. So it wasn't known quite as much as the Boston movement then. The headquarters mm-hmm. was in Boston, and it moved there. They believe very much we'll learn in their teachings about a central leadership. And Kip was the top. He was the top guy. Um, He was the Pope, really more than the Pope. Even he was the top man in charge. Um, He moved to Los Angeles, started the the church there. And then the Crossroads Church of Christ back in Gainesville, where he had started, broke off from the ICOC. I thought that was a pretty interesting piece of history right there. So, so a lot of churches find... that were part of the Crossroads movement had joined, including Crossroads right. itself. But in 1990, the Crossroads Church of Christ itself broke off from the ICOC. Did you find reasoning why? Or was it just a... Only theory that people posted because the ICOC uh, was so much more strict about right. things. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, yeah, the discipling movement, shepherding yeah. movement they were part of was so intense. And Crossroads was going back more mainstream Church of Christ. Right. So there had been a lot of dissension between the mainstream Churches of Christ and the ICOC. The ICOC, mm-hmm. was during all this time, has been part of the Church of Christ. Right. But those are a fairly loose affiliation of churches anyway. They don't have a strict hierarchy in any anyway. They're mostly autonomous congregations who are just in cooperation with each other, mm-hmm. the Churches of Christ. So the ICOC was much, much more regulated and controlled, but still part of the Churches of Christ. Um, in 1992, the ICOC formed Hope Worldwide. It was a charity, their benevolent arm. The reason this is important, we'll go over in their teachings, is because they require members to not only tithe to the church, but to give very heavily to their charity. Almost all members of the ICOC tithe at least 20% of their income, often quite a bit more than that. Wow. Lots more, usually. Usually it's 20% tithe and then 40 times your tithe twice a year. Mm. Um, Anything you go and find about the ICOC, you'll find them talking about Hope Worldwide and their charity and the different things they're doing and asking for money. Right. It was a big thing. It was a lot of projects that Kip himself was leading through Hope Worldwide. In 1993, it all kind of came to a point there. 
And that's when the, formerly the Churches of Christ did no longer want to be involved with the International Church of Christ. Right. Um, they really hadn't been communicating much with the other Churches of Christ or working with them. Um, it kind of formalized what already existed there between the Crossroads Boston Movement and the regular Churches of Christ. And I know we're going to go over it in the teachings, but I just got to mention the reason this is so important here is that the uh, Kip taught that they were the only church. They taught he taught that mm-hmm. they were they were reestablishing the real church, and they were the only church. So if you were a member of the Church of Christ down the street, it you weren't saved unless you were baptized and became a member of the International Churches of Christ Church right. in your town. Yep. Um, in 1994, the ICOC established its own educational institution. Now, this here is where I, again, found some in, some information that's a little confusing to me. I know they have their own in, educational institution. Mm-hmm. However, there's in a lot of this research, it's so hard to figure out what was what is ICC, which is a later movement Kip started, right. and what is and ICOC. What is ICOC? And part yep. of that is that during the time of the ICOC, often people inside the ICOC called it ICOC, but sometimes they called it ICC. Mm-hmm. So you'll find things written that reference ICC, but they really mean the ICOC, but it was written in 1994 when the ICC didn't exist. Right. Yeah, it's, it's Obfus- a lot, so I have to sift through. Obfuscation. Ob- obfuscation. Obfuscation. Obfuscation on purpose. Yep. Right. It is intentionally hard. So I know they started founding their own education, teaching their own seminary type stuff but it's not exactly clear what's what with that. Um, in the late nineties, there was more and more criticism. They started making the news from things. Mm-hmm. Former members started speaking out. The truth is they had a lot of former members. They have way more former members than actual yeah. members. Yeah. By huge amounts because they, they just churn through people like crazy. Yeah. It's what, like five to one or 10 to one. I mean, it's a crazy high number. Yeah. Yeah. I think I heard some number about for every five people they bring in, 1.21 stay. Mm. Over five people that, that join, 1.21 right. stay. Something like that. It's an insane number. Um, this is also where they were every, – every so they started – they planted churches in cities around the country yeah. and around the world. They wanted to be made in, in more population areas, and they were big about campus ministries in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. They weren't exclusively doing campus ministries like Crossroads was. They're real big about it. And this time in the 90s when all these articles were coming out and some college campuses elected to kick the ICOC recruiters off their campus. Yep. So, hey, you can't be here. You're, you're going from evangelizing people to harassing people. Mm-hmm. And I imagine this made it harder for other college ministries and stuff as well. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I had found a list, but I don't, I don't have that list handy, I don't think. Did you ever, was, I know, uh, I, as my readers know, I didn't go to college. Did you ever come across any college ministry things when you were in college, or did you, were you involved in such? Um, I was I was involved in a couple, my first go-round, a um, couple little Baptist groups. Um, had a friend that was at the, the Church of Christ group, so I'd go with them every now and then. Um, you know what? My wife actually uh, attended a Church of Christ whenever she was in college. Mm-hmm. Because her friends went there, I think, and went there to worship and that sort of stuff, you know, learn yep. about the Bible. Um, even though she didn't grow up Church of Christ, she is in Church of Christ now, but she attended the Church of Christ Church. But it was not an ICOC church. Right. I, I know that because you've met my wife. <laughs> right. She wouldn't deal with this type <laughs> of people. Yeah. Um, so then, then things really made a turn. Mm-hmm. 2001 to 2002 was when things really changed in the ICOC. See, what happened was Kip's daughter, Olivia, was ready to go off to college. Now, Kip's yep. children had lived a life of luxury. Oh, yeah. They, 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 they lived really well off the church. The church tithes really well. Kip brought in good money. He moved them from Boston to L.A., and they were children of L.A., okay? Chip's daughter, Olivia, apparently was very talented. Very talented, and she ended up getting into Harvard. Mm-hmm. Now, they actually sent a discipler to go with her to Harvard. 
so that she would have a discipler with her. Um, but she ended up choosing to leave the church. Right. Rumors started going around. I was reading some old Google groups posts from back in the day. Remember those? Nice. Those were good. And, and I was thinking it may not have been Google groups. I was reading it on Google groups, but I'm thinking right. 2001 Google 2000, groups didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Cause Google had just, so what did they acquire? They didn't acquire Yahoo's um, groups. They acquired some other group thing. Yeah, I'm sure. Probably should have more research on that. That's, the, that's a technology side thing. Something that Google acquired, because it's now on the Google groups, but it was yeah. called something else back then. I seen where there was rumors where people were talking about, did y'all hear about Olivia left? She left the church. And here's why this was a big deal. Because Kip had taught mm-hmm. that... The Bible says that if you are not a good steward of your family, if your children leave the church, then you cannot be a leader in the church. Right. And Kip was the leader. Yep. What Kip had done is he did a- appoint elders in the church. And unlike some other cult leaders we've talked about, the elders did have the authority over him. Mm-hmm. Now, they yep. listened to him on spiritual matters. He was the evangelist, and they were the elders, Right. Right. So he had some spiritual you know, influence with them for sure, but they had authority over him. And so in this case, in 2001, the elders asked McKean, uh, Kit McKean to take a sabbatical. Um, the church was growing even more rapidly. His very strict um, style of leadership was, was just rubbing the wrong way more and more on people. And then his daughter stepped Did out. Did meant? And there that was are. just the excuse that was needed there. Right. And so the the leaders, the elders, had asked him to take to, to take take a leave of absence, take a sabbatical. He did this for a year, and he came back in 2002 and submitted a letter of resignation. Mm-hmm. He said his own shortcomings as well as well as all the pressure and division within the moment, saying that uh, him and his wife were going to take off and concentrate on their family and that sort of thing. Right. What do you think about that? Did did you did you watch the the there's a YouTube video of him explaining the history of the movement? Did you watch that video? I did not. Okay. He he talks about this moment um in their their leadership probably more than most people would have. Um but he he goes into a lot of um there's other leaders that have had this happen and this, that, and the other. And he's, he's making a lot of, this shouldn't have happened the way that it did. The leaders in the mainline church of Christ have been influencing the international church of Christ leaders and causing all sorts of problems. And he's, he's throwing a lot of blame around. uh, Well, he originally left taking the blame for himself. Mm -hmm. Yep. But. Hold a fast one. Yes. In 2003, so the next year, really just a few months later, Mm -hmm. the ICOC was left without Kip as the leader. Yep. And they, those churches got together, the elders got together and they came up with what's called the unity proposal. Uh, It was aimed was to restructure and redefine the movement. And it was kind of met with mixed success. They were changing their structure. It wasn't going to be just one single guy at the top anymore. Mm -hmm. Going more like the way the uh, Church of Christ is actually led but right. more strictly than that though too um at the same time the icoc church in portland called kip and said hey we need a pastor why don't you come be the pastor of our church mm-hmm. so instead of being over the whole movement he's just over the church in portland over that one church yep well he kept plotting mm-hmm. by 2006 um Kit McKean actually was over the Portland family of churches inside the ICOC, just like he did with the original, um, with the Crossroads movement. All of a sudden, now there are several churches who are loyal to Kip, and that's right. the Portland family of churches. It's a whole new movement, very similar to the original ICOC mm-hmm. model, a whole organization, and he renamed that the International Christian Church. Um, that same year, the ICOC officially disfellowshipped Kit McKean. 
So they officially kicked him out, basically. Right. Um, then he did even more. Y'all going to see this timeline kind of repeating right here. Uh-huh. In 2000, so he was in Portland, and he got some other churches, and the way he brought those other churches in was the same thing. They come to him and said, hey, we see how you're growing things in Portland. Can you help us grow things at our church? He said, yes, send all your leadership to Portland. I'll see new leaders to your church. They'll grow your church. I'll teach your leaders. Then I'll send them to another church. He intentionally mixed them up. It's a very common theme that you see from the old ICOC and even the current ICOC, Mm -hmm. and definitely in the ICC, that they send leaders to different places that they're not from on purpose. Right. Um. And we'll talk more about that in their numbers and their charts and their organization of that. <laughs> but in 2007, so just another year later, Kent McKee moved back to L.A. and starts a new church called the City of Angels, Angels. ICC. International Christian Church. Yep. <laughs> so now he's directly going after the church in L.A. Mm-hmm. that he had left. Mm-hmm. He brought 40 members from the Portland church to start the new church in L.A. And same thing. He grew it huge. In 2008, a charity was formed. They called it Mercy Worldwide. Very similar to Hope Worldwide, but this one was for the ICC. A couple more years later, 2012, International College of Christian Ministries, an ICC college was formed. Yep. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah. Some IC, ICOC churches decided to leave and join the ICC. Some brand new congregations were formed. Kind of a mixture of things. In 2010, many of the ICOC churches began to adopt more mainstream Christian practices. They moved away from the controversial discipler right. thing and the cult-like elements in the church. Discipleship, discipleship came more optional and more like you see regular mainline churches do mm-hmm. discipleship and not this one-on-one make every decision in your life for you type thing. Right. Now that's now, the ICOC, not that's the ICC. That's the ICOC. And I will say right. that that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen There's some still stuff an that... awful lot of mixture back and forth. Mm-hmm. There are many former members of the ICOC who think the ICC is still part of the ICOC and it's some shadow government type thing. <laughs> maybe that's a conspiracy, but maybe there's some truth to it. There's not right. a lot of the ICOC says some good things out in public, but then other things they don't say. Yeah. And so it's, it's a little confusing, honestly, but there are definitely, I want to at least acknowledge there are mm-hmm. some people who very much think the ICOC is still controlled by Kip, just not directly versus there are leaders of the ICOC and the ICOC doesn't right. have a strict leadership like it did before. So it's hard for them to talk as one. Um, in 2012, they did mm-hmm. kind of firm that up a little bit, and they officially formed the ICOC Cooperation uh, Co-op of Churches initiative, which was to get better collaboration between the individual churches. Um, right. Then that took us to the 2020s which is now, and we're getting close on our time, mm-hmm. so I'm doing pretty good. The yeah, ICOC continues to exist. They're a global network of churches. They have kind of varying degrees of how centralized the control is. Mm-hmm. Um, some people still praise the movement for rapid growth and biblical teachings and things like that. Some people still criticize it for the sins of the past. Right. Um, they went from that rigid central control where one man controlled everything, so that's kind of a cooperation of the churches working together. Currently, it's estimated they have about 755 churches and 155 nations. 34 regional families of churches, because they split things up that way. And we'll talk about that when we talk about how they're they're organized. Um, And they work more in these regions now. The ICC, where Kip was Mm -hmm. currently the leader, has estimated, this is their numbers, they put out 121 churches in 55 countries. So... He's very much been regrowing yeah. what, it, what he lost. I found yeah. it very interesting. The ICC only has churches in 37 out of 50 states. No church in Arkansas, no church in Tennessee, and no church in Mississippi. Hmm. I'm not sure that means anything, but that's just weird to me. You would think, one, most large 
denominations have something in Nashville. Right. We both know about that, right? Yep. Um, a lot of denominations started in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of you know churches represented in Arkansas in some capacity or another. Arkansas yep. may be a capacity thing. There's probably just a couple areas in Arkansas that are big enough that they'd want to target. I mean, you'd think they'd want to be in Fayetteville. But you'd think they'd want to be in Fayetteville. I know. So that's that's very interesting to me. Uh, but they're still, they are international, and they're real big about that. Right. Yeah, I mean, to be in 55 countries sounds more like their their focus is go international first. Yeah. So now there's two groups, the ICOC and the ICC. Yep. Um, and then the latest thing was in 2023, Rolling Stone came out with an article which they interviewed several former members Mm -hmm. who allege a long history of here we come, every cult we talk about covering up sexual assault by its leaders. Yep. This is something a lot of churches have been guilty of, honestly, Mm -hmm. of, Oh, it'd be bad for the ministry. If we found out that the youth minister was a pedophile or cousin Joe's an elder in this church, we can't turn him in. This is old news, right? This is old news that shouldn't be, but it is repeated over and over again because the problems weren't handled in the first place. Mm-hmm. And it looks like there's problems with that. And there's some lawsuits going around and we'll link to the Rolling Stone article. I'm sure um, that, that goes over some of this. So there's definitely more news coming about this as these old allegations are coming up and there, there's all these stories. I've been watching all kinds of victims on YouTube who've been talking about the abuse they've suffered from the ICC in the right. ICOC, whether it was controlling of their life, whether it was covering up sexual abuse that happened mm-hmm. in the church. And it wasn't necessarily that the Kip said this should happen or things, but he definitely fostered an environment that covered it up on purpose. It allowed it. Right. Yep. Um, so that's kind of what made us start looking into this. And then as we started peeling back the onion, we've seen all this stuff. So y'all, that's pretty much the history. You have anything else to add to that, Brian? No, I think you you covered every bit of history that is going to be relevant, right? Yes. Yeah, I, there's some things I didn't go into. Yep. And there's some stuff maybe we'll talk a little more about when we get into the teachings and social episodes. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's the history of the ICOC and the ICC and uh, Kit McKean, y'all. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matt.